The year is 122, and the Roman Empire is absolutely killing it. And you, a Roman legionary, have just been posted to Emperor Hadrian's brand new 73-mile-long wall in Britain, Hadrian's Wall. Clever name. Now, you know that you should be watching out, protecting the empire from marauding wildlings or Caledonians, but all you can think is, what's for dinner? Well, how about this dish of Minutal Matianum, ancient Roman pork with apples? So thank you to Wondrium for sponsoring this video as we dine on Hadrian's Wall, this time on Tasting History. So last summer I actually got to visit Hadrian's Wall along with a large fort just south of the wall called Vindolanda, which was actually built before the wall in the year 85. And besides getting to see the ruins of the fort itself, they also have this fantastic museum filled with all these artifacts found at the site that give you an idea of what daily life at the fort was like. Everything from swords and coins to the things that really interest me, like cooking pots, amphorae for holding wine and garum, and even oyster shells with a little tool for eating them. They've also found hundreds of fragments of writing at the site from as early as the late first century. And a lot of them mention food, giving us an idea of what those people stationed at the very frontier of the Roman Empire would have eaten. Now, since they are just fragments of writing, we rarely get the full picture of what they were eating or what they were doing, but in just two fragments, we do get a good idea that they were eating a lot more than just bread and pulse or porridge. They had a really wide variety of food available to them. One even mentions pork, specifically pork crackling, trotters, Flavius Cerealis to his Brocus, greetings. If you love me, brother, I ask that you send me some hunting nets. Emotionally manipulative, but relatable. Now, in another fragment, they talk about a lot of ingredients that would have excited any ancient Roman gourmand. Bruised beans, two modi. Chickens, 20. A hundred apples, if you can find nice ones. A hundred or two hundred eggs, if they are for sale there at a fair price. Mulsum, honey-flavored wine. Eight sextari of garum, a modius of olives. So with some of these ingredients, along with others that we know were available at Vindolanda at the time, we can recreate this dish from Apicius for Minutal Matianum, a recipe likely named after Gaius Matius, who was a friend of Julius Caesar and was known for his facility in the art of topiary as well as his love of cooking. He's thought to have actually written three cookbooks at least, or collections of recipes. Unfortunately, they don't survive, but this recipe might be based on one of those. Though he also had an apple named after him, so it's possible that it's simply named after the apple. Now, we don't know for sure that they ate this dish at Vindolando or Hadrian's Wall. It's merely conjecture. It's possible, but it's conjecture. And a lot of ancient Roman history is based on some conjecture because there are a lot of pieces of history missing, which is why I am loving this series from today's sponsor, Wondrium, called A Historian Goes to the Movies, Ancient Rome. It's really interesting to have somebody kind of lay out what's real, what's not, and what might be somewhere in between, like the famous Ninth Legion, the Lost Legion of Rome. Several books and several movies have been made about this lost legion who was thought to have traveled beyond Hadrian's Wall and was probably wiped out by the Britons because they were never heard of again. The only problem is there really isn't any historical evidence to suggest that that actually happened. Now, they did disappear from the historical record, but that doesn't mean that they actually disappeared or that we know what caused it. It's a really wonderful series to accompany the many wonderful series on Wondrium. Their offerings are presented by experts in their field and cover every subject from history to travel to art and business and even how to learn musical instruments. So to give Wondrium a try, you can get a free trial by clicking the link in the description or visiting wondrium.com slash tasting history. Now let's get back to this recipe. Put oil, garum, stock, chopped leek and cilantro and small ground meatballs in a pot. Chop previously cooked shoulder of pork with skin into cubes, cook all together. Halfway through cooking, add cord and diced matian apples. While it cooks, grind pepper, cumin, cilantro, and coriander seed, mint, and silphium root, pour in vinegar, honey, garum, defrutum, and some of the cooking liquid. Adjust the flavors with vinegar, bring to a boil, add broken tracta to thicken, sprinkle pepper, and serve. So it is a lot of ingredients, and you can save yourself some time by buying some ham or some pre-cooked pork, but you can also make your own pork shoulder using an ancient Roman base of olive oil, salt, pepper, and some honey. 
slather that on the pork, and then put it in the oven at 450 degrees Fahrenheit, 230 Celsius for about 15 minutes, and then lower the temperature to 275 degrees Fahrenheit, 135 Celsius, and cook for about an hour per pound, or until the center hits a temperature of at least 165 degrees. Now all you need for this recipe is one pound or 450 grams of the pork shoulder cut into cubes, but most pork shoulders are quite a bit larger, so you'll have some for, for lunch tomorrow. Then take one tablespoon of olive oil and heat it in a pot, then add three-fourths of a pound or 340 grams of pork or ground beef formed into little balls, and you may want to add some egg to help bind them. Also add a cup of chopped leeks, then let them cook for eight to 10 minutes or until they start to brown, then deglaze the pot with a cup or 235 milliliters of chicken stock and two teaspoons of garum. So if this is your first time watching one of the ancient Roman recipes here on the channel, garum is the ancient Roman fish sauce that is in absolutely everything that they made. Though usually it's actually just the liquid part, which was called liquaman. And modern versions of it do still exist, so I'll put a link in the description to where you can get some of those. But the very first episode that really made this channel take off a few months after I started it was when I made garum. Though I made garum using a Byzantine recipe for quick garum because I was living in a tiny apartment and I didn't want, you know, fish guts on my, on my, uh, table for, for months at a time because that's what it takes to make real garum. But now I have a backyard, so I'm doing it. In a couple weeks, or as soon as it warms up a little bit, I am going to start True Garum, which does take several months, and I'm going to do a whole video on it once it's all done. But if you want to follow along with the process, just follow me on Instagram, Tasting History with Max Miller. I'm going to document the whole thing. Now, after you've added the garum to the pot, toss in a small handful of chopped cilantro, as well as the pound or so of pork. And this will let off some juice, but you're also going to need to add some more stock as it goes. You want to make sure that there's enough that it kind of covers the bottom that it's simmering in, but it's not a soup, so you don't need to like fill it up with stock. Then let it simmer for 15 minutes, and then add in a pound of sweet apples, which have been cored and cut into cubes. Then let this cook for another 20 minutes or until the ground meat is fully cooked. Now the last thing we need to create is the sauce, but before we do that, I want to let you know some of the other foods that would be available to you should you ever find yourself shipped off to Hadrian's Wall. So two years ago, I did a video on what the average Roman soldier would have eaten, focusing mainly on what they would have eaten while on the march. And that was laridum ac bucellatum atque acetum. Lard or fatty bacon, hardtack, and sour wine that could have been used to make Posca. But most of the soldiers living along Rome's northern frontier were actually living in forts and so had a much more varied and frankly appetizing diet available to them. Now they would have had two main meals a day, one in the morning and one around sunset. And just like in today's military, you were told when you were going to eat. The hour for supper and breakfast is not left to individual discretion. All take their meals together. This was done at the command of a trumpet, as were the hours of sleep, sentinel duty, and rising. Though like me, the average Roman soldier did like a snack, and so they would have been able to eat throughout the day on foods that they carried with them, like nuts and wild berries, like slow berries, raspberries, and wild strawberries, all of which grew in the area. Now, at many of the forts, there was no large mess hall where all of the men got together in one spot to eat, but rather each century, or more often a pair of centuries, would find a spot to eat together. A century being 80 soldiers with a centurion to lead them. And that centurion was usually the one making the decision on who made the meals, because there was rarely, if ever, like a designated cook, who that's his only job. Instead, the men had to cook for themselves, or more often for their small group of eight soldiers called a contubernium. This was the smallest organized group of soldiers in the Roman army, and each day one of them would usually be tasked with grinding all of the grain for the other seven men. And according to records, that took four hours of grinding grain by hand. And as someone who has ground some grain by hand for like 20 minutes, I would not last one hour in the Roman army. Some of the kerns used to grind this grain have actually been found and had the names of their owners engraved on them, like the soldier Africanus or another marked as the property of Victorinus. 
but exactly what grain Victorian oats would have been grinding depended on several factors. Now, ideally, it would have been wheat, mostly spelt or bread wheat or common wheat, which were grown throughout the area and so would have been easily had, though rye and oats seem to have been used frequently as well. They were likely the grains that were grown by the local Britons, who get several mentions in those writings from Vindolanda. You will receive, out of the Britons' carts, 381 modi of grain. Furthermore, they have loaded 53 modi into each individual cart. But there was another grain that was quite common and far less desirable. Curtius super to his casium, greetings. So that you may explain, and so that they may get from you barley as commercial goods. Again, these writings are fragments, so things are missing, and sometimes it doesn't quite make sense, but you get the gist. He's talking about barley. Barley was one of the most plentiful grains used in the area, but no fighting man would want it for his dinner. Usually it was used for either making beer or sometimes to thicken a pulse or porridge. It was eaten as fodder for the animals or those lowest people in society, the slaves. But there were occasions where a legionary would find himself with a dense loaf of barley bread for his dinner, and that was considered a punishment. In his military manual, Vegetius talks about a certain drill, basically weapons training, and then says, The old Romans were so conscious of its usefulness that they rewarded the masters at arms with double allowance of provision. The soldiers who were lacking in this drill were punished by having their allowance in barley. Nor did they receive it as usual, in wheat, until they showed sufficient proof of their knowledge of every part of their study. No wheat for you. But whether you earned your wheat or were saddled with barley, once ground it would be baked into bread using a communal oven, or several communal ovens. Forts had ovens similar to huge pizza ovens built into the stone ramparts that encircled the camp. This helped to prevent fires breaking out. Though there were times when the loaves were baked on hot coals, especially if you were outside of camp. Even the Emperor Caracalla, who was with the legions in Britain just north of Hadrian's Wall in the year 211, was known to bake his bread this way. With his own hand, he would grind his personal ration of grain, make it into a loaf, bake it in the ashes, and eat it. Just one of the guys. Though I'm sure as soon as he got back to the fort, he was glad that he had more options available than just bread. Because the Roman forts in this area may have started out just to house the troops, but very quickly became like small city centers. Soldiers housed their wives and children, and those families expected more to eat than the typical ration. And with the excellent road system that the Romans built, records from only a few years after Rome conquered the area show that nearly every luxury item in the empire was available at those forts. Anfore of garum, olives, olive oil, and wine were available to nearly everyone. In fact, evidence shows that wine was being imported to Britain even before the Romans set out to conquer it. And the Romans didn't just import foods, but began growing new foods locally, introducing several types of onion, leek, parsnip, beet, radish, lettuce, cucumber, garlic, broad beans, and a more edible carrot. And by the year 90 or so, the texts from Vindolanda show that soldiers were ordering food that was coming all the way from Syria and northern Africa, from which many of the soldiers also came. There were even some foods coming from the very far east. Spices. Roe deer of salt, young pig, ham of wheat, venison for pickling of emmer. And the pigs and ham would have probably been pretty local. In fact, we know some of the names of the people who were tending to those pigs, like in one account of a man who was doling out grain to people around the fort. A count of wheat measured out from which I myself have put into the barrel. To the ox herds in the wood, eight modi. To the legionary soldiers on the order of Firmus, eleven modi. To Luco in charge of the pigs. To father in charge of the oxen. I just think it's so cool that we know that nearly 2,000 years ago, at a fort called Vindolanda, on the very northern frontier of the Roman Empire, a man named Luco was tending to some pigs. We also know the name of someone who was very fond of eating those pigs. Felicio the Centurion. Bacon, 45 pounds. Likewise, lard, 15 and a half pounds. Felicio the Centurion as a loan, 21 May, received spices, a half sextarius, a half denarius, received gruel, received eggs. 
Eggs, bacon, and spices. Felicio was definitely eating well. There are also orders for goat meat, as well as hunting records for wild deer and birds like ducks and swans, as well as salmon, trout, and pike caught from the South Tyne River. Sheep and cattle were also found grazing nearby and could provide both milk and meat for the men and their families. Though for Flavius Cerealis, the prefect of the ninth cohort of Batavians, he impressed his guests with chicken. He entertained the elite of Britain on several occasions, and in the year 104, he entertained the governor of Britain himself, and chicken was on the menu. First of May, for the Singularis, on the visit of the governor, consumed at lunch, chickens, number four. And they would have been well flavored, as they ordered and brought through Adiutor from London, a set of cooking bowls, ten denarii, mustard seed, anise, caraway, thyme, one sextarius, one eighth denarius. And as one mustn't neglect their veggies, there is a record of one Julius Vericundus sending his slave to pick up some greens, and then gently admonishing him for mixing up the keys. Julius Vericundus to Audax, greetings. As soon as it will have been possible, send in the morning part of the load which I have today dispatched to you with two loose horses, lest it be damaged by the conveyance in which the greens will be brought, that is, the shoots both of cabbage and of turnip, and send them. Also, you sent another key with the box than you should have, for this is said to be the key of the little storeroom. Now, as I mentioned, wine was widely available to the men. Whether it was the fine wine that came from Greece, or the sweet wine, passum, that came from usually Italy, or the wine aketum, or a sour wine, and that was used to make posca. And surely the men that were stationed there, who had grown up around the Mediterranean, would have preferred wine to drink. But most of the first garrisons in the area were actually Tungrians and Batavians. And while Roman citizens, they did not come from Italy, but from the lands that are now northern France and the Netherlands. And according to Tacitus, their drink is a liquor prepared from barley or wheat brought by fermentation to a certain resemblance of wine. That is, beer, or a form of it, and most Romans had a contempt for it and the people who drank it, and no one had more contempt for it than Pliny the Elder. They take these drinks unmixed, and do not dilute them with water the way that wine is modified. And yet, by Hercules, one really might have supposed that there the earth produced nothing but grain for the people's use. Alas, what wondrous skill, and yet how misplaced. Means have absolutely been discovered for getting drunk upon water, even. But those Tungrians and Batavians guarding Britain absolutely loved it. There are many, many orders for this Celtic beer. Musclus to Cerealis, his king, greeting. Please, my lord, give instructions as to what you want us to have done tomorrow. Farewell. My fellow soldiers have no beer. Please order some to be sent. What's interesting is that the word for this beer usually appears as cerveza or cervese, which likely came from a Celtic word for beer. But today, in Spanish, the word is still cerveza, a bottle of which would actually probably go pretty well with this ancient Roman pork and apples, which still needs a sauce. So for that, what you'll need is one teaspoon of cumin, two teaspoons chopped cilantro, one tablespoon of coriander seeds, two teaspoons chopped mint, and one teaspoon of peppercorns or about four long pepper. Both were available in ancient Rome, though long pepper did tend to be more expensive, which is actually still the case today, but probably because it's a little bit better. It doesn't have quite as much heat, but it has more flavor to it, so I do prefer it. And I'll put a link in the description to where you can get that, as well as asafetida. You'll need a half teaspoon. And this was the pungent replacement for Rome's favorite spice, silphium, which was thought to have gone extinct during the time of Nero, and so they used this as a replacement. Though recently, they think they've actually maybe found silphium growing again in Turkey. They don't know, but they think probably. But either way, you're not going to get your hands on it, so stick with the asafetida. So grind all of these together, then put them in a saucepan with a quarter cup of white wine vinegar, two tablespoons of honey, one teaspoon of garum, and a quarter cup of defrutum. And that is grape musk that has been reduced to a thick sweet syrup, and today you can buy it under the name Saba or Sapa, and it's my new favorite condiment. I put that on everything. Finally add a quarter cup of the liquid from the simmering meat and stir everything together, bringing it to a gentle boil. Then mix two teaspoons of starch or corn flour in with a little water and add that to the sauce and let it simmer for a couple minutes as it thickens. Then dish up the pork and apples, pour the sauce over it, and here we are. Ancient Roman pork with apples. We'll put a little cracked pepper on that puppy, and 
give it a try. So we will go with just some of the pork, but I'm gonna dip it into the sauce because that's what you really want. Here we are. I'm gonna try some of the apple. That's fantastic. There's definitely something very ancient Roman about the flavor with the with the defrutum and the garum and asafetida, but there's something also very familiar with it. It's it hits you, the, the vinegar really hits you. So it's kind of sour at first, but then that quickly fades away and it just becomes sweet and yet aromatic and complex. This, I think, is the best ancient Roman dish that I have made. Not it is definitely the best ancient Roman dish that I've made. I'm going to try one of the, uh, one of the meatballs. That's awesome. That's, that's me patting my own back because that is fantastic. You know, with ancient Roman cooking, they don't give you the, the exact quantities of everything. So you kind of have to, to make it up yourself to your tastes. And this is definitely to my tastes. This one is absolutely worth making. And I don't always say that, but this one absolutely is. It's a lot of ingredients, but it's fun and complex and, and not that hard. So make this one and I will see you next time on Tasting History.